Well, my name is JC Feldhuizen. Uh, I want to thank uh, Histori Bersama uh, for organizing this uh, seminar and uh, for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with all of you. I will talk about my uh, political party, uh, about, the, uh, about racism in the Netherlands, and about the relation between Indo-Europeans and racism, and I will conclude with um, my perspective on fighting racism. So since last year, I'm a dual city council member in Amsterdam for the political party Bij A, and the pillars of our party are radical equality and economical justice which means we combine anti-racist, feminist, and queer politics with anti-capitalism. As a dual city council member for Bahrain, uh, anti-racism and decolonization is one of the themes that I'm responsible for. And just to give you an example of what I'm doing, I'll share one initiative I took. So the city of Amsterdam is currently in the research phase of a project focused on introducing a new curriculum on Dutch colonialism for all primary and secondary schools in Amsterdam. And looking at this project, I found out that the involvement of the Dutch in the slave trade in the region of the Indian Ocean wasn't mentioned at all. This is quite remarkable because the Dutch uh, shipped over uh, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of enslaved people across the Indian Ocean. Uh, fortunately, I succeeded uh, in gathering broad support from other political parties to include the Dutch involvement in slavery in the region uh, of the Indian Ocean in the new curriculum. So. Uh, Party, our political party is relatively new and still very small, but I think most people in the Netherlands, they, uh, are, uh, they know about us. But not because of our politics, though, mostly because the founder and leader of BAE is a black woman that speaks up against racism. As a result of her speaking up against racism, the leader of our party, Sylvana Simons, who is also our only city council member here in Amsterdam, has been dealing with masses of death threats. The threats uh, started coming in from the moment she first spoke out against uh, the racist blackface tradition Black Pete or Zwarte Piet on television back in 2015. And since then, the racist and sexist threats continue to this day. So the anger and hate that burst out as a result of uh, someone speaking up against racism, especially when this someone is a black woman, uh, says a lot about the problem of racism in the Netherlands. Uh, Professor Gloria Becker, in her book White Innocence, points out that there is a gaping absence of discussions on race in Dutch academia. In her book, Professor Wecker describes how the, Dutch, how the Dutch build up a cultural archive, which is a set of patterns in our knowledge, attitude, and emotions, based upon 400 years of colonial rule. As a result, the Dutch see uh, the Netherlands as a gentle and ethical nation, and in the same time, uh, racism and xenophobia is uh, passionately uh, being denied. But anyone who takes a, a deeper look at Dutch society will see right away that it's filled with subtle but also more blatant forms of racism. There are many examples. Um, I'll give you a, a few on uh, inter-institutional -inst racism in the Netherlands. So one, uh, colonial history and colonial villains are honored in public space as if colonialism is something to be proud of. Even mass murderers are being honored with big statues and streets named after them. Two, education materials are almost always based upon a Eurocentric perspective, often glorifying colonialism. In one school book, for example, and slave people that stood up against their colonial oppressors are being visualized as some kind of evil demons, as if it's them and not those who enslaved them uh, were uh, evil. Three, when ending primary school, children with a migration background structurally receive lower advice for their secondary school level than their white classmates with exact the same grades. Four, there is structural discrimination in the job market against people with a migration background. Literally every year another study is published that confirms this problem, even going so far that some employment agencies don't mind to work with companies that request only white employees. Five, and the last one, uh, the police violate human rights on a structural level. Um, even in Amsterdam, which is uh, far more progressive than the most of the rest of the Netherlands, the chief of police can stop police officers from ethnic profiling. Remind you that Amnesty International points out for many years already that ethnic profiling is a form of discrimination and a violation of human rights. 
But it's not only institutional racism that people of color have to deal with. In her book, Daily Racism, Professor Philomena Asset delves into the phenomenon of daily racism, which she defines as different types and forms of racism that racialized groups experience in everyday life when interacting with dominant white groups. I want to give credit to Professor Weckel and Professor Asset because they have made such important contributions to anti-racist thinking in the Netherlands and the anti-racism racism movement here, and I definitely advise you to read both uh, books if you want to uh, learn more about racism in the Netherlands, and both books are published in Dutch and in English. Um, from here on, I will mostly talk about my own cultural identities, since I'm a living product of Dutch colonialism, and thus a living product of Dutch racism. I'm what they call an Indo-European, which is described on Wikipedia as the following. In its narrowest sense, the term refers to people in the former Dutch East Indies who held European legal status but who were of mixed descent, that are descendants of various indigenous peoples of Indonesia and Dutch settlers. In the broadest sense, an Indo-European is anyone of mixed European and Indonesian descent. Okay, I think I'm going to do it like this. So my father was born in uh, Maidan on Sumatra from Indo-European parents in a time when the Netherlands was still considered uh, in the time when the Netherlands still considered Indonesia to be uh, to be their colony, and the Dutch roots on my father's side they lead back to the grandfather of my grandfather. He was the first Feldhausen to go to the Dutch East Indies, and this great grandfather of mine was an agricultural entrepreneur a rich and racist slave owner that never set foot on the ground because he was always carried around by enslaved people. His culture and his identity and his name, they were passed on in our family, but the culture's identities and the names of the indigenous women in my family fell into oblivion. Next to me, there are at least one and a half million other Indo-Europeans in the Netherlands. When I grew up, though, I barely met any Indo-Europeans that critically engaged with their identity and history. So this was one of the reasons for me to get together with Mare van Splinter, Sadiqa de Jong, Rochelle van Mane, and Bayou Junai, who is there, hello, uh, to start decolonization network uh, former Dutch East Indies, which is a grassroots initi initiative mainly focused on connecting uh, people who engage with the colonial history of the former Dutch East Indies in a critical way. Now a look at the role of Indo-Europeans in Dutch politics shows the necessity uh, and the urgency of our network. The only two extreme right-wing parties in the parliament are founded by Indo-Europeans. So Thierry Baudet, founder and the leader of uh, the Forum for Democracy, which, was the, which became the biggest party in the last elections, openly proclaimed, uh, among many other racist statements, that he thinks that Europe should stay dominantly white. Geert Wilders, founder and leader of the Freedom Party, was even convicted for the incitement uh, to discrimination for one of his many racist statements. And uh, Baudet and Wilders both want to close the borders and get rid of anti-discrimination laws and international human rights treaties. So if we want to but if we want to get a better understanding of the relationship between Indo-Europeans and racism, we need to take a deeper look at uh, colonial history in the former Dutch East Indies. In his book, Dunyai de Concunibate in the Dutch East Indies, Reggie Bai describes how the influx of male white Europeans into the Dutch colony led to the creation of Indo-European children, not uncommonly as a result of rape of enslaved indigenous women. Although some of these children were raised as Europeans, their mixed blood made them inferior to white people in the colonial racist hierarchy. These people had indigenous blood, so they were seen as unreliable, manipulating, dumb, and undeveloped. Many of them became outcasts in colonial society. At some point, though, as Reggie Bai describes, the Dutch started to realize that the growing group of Indo-Europeans living in impoverished conditions could become a threat for the colonial order. So in the end of the 19th century, a Dutch member of parliament called upon the government to take action because, and I quote, this is the duty of the state and it's in our own interest because the growing race of impoverished Indos hates us with an unstoppable hate and this hate is not undeserved, unquote. 
So around the turn of the around the turn of the century, the colonial government and its colonial and the colonial civil society started organizing initiatives focused on improving the situation of the impoverished Indo-Europeans. But not so much because they cared about their well-being, mostly because they wanted them to become part of, part of the oppressing colonial system instead of them revolting against it. Around the same time, Indo-Europeans started organizing themselves. The biggest Indo-European organization, the Indo-Europees Verbond, was founded in 1990. Characteristic for the Indo-Europees Verbond was that they saw the indigenous people as unwelcome competitors who received more benefits from the colonial government than them. The fact that the Indo-Europees Verbond became the biggest Indo-European organization, uh, organization says a lot about the position of Indo-Europeans in the colonial racist hierarchy and the fact that many of them internalized racism instead of rejecting it. So instead of fighting the colonial occupation side by side with the indigenous anti-colonial freedom fighters, most Indo-Europeans chose to align themselves with the colonial oppressor. Sometimes because they were simply raised as Europeans and thus identified as such, sometimes because poverty led them no other choice than to join the colonial army. When the Dutch finally recognized the independence of Indonesia, after they killed more than 100,000 people in an attempt to maintain their colony, most Indo-Europeans fled to the Netherlands. And so did my family, most of my family, although a lot of them quite quickly uh, moved out because it was too cold and rainy here. <laughs> so although the colony wasn't uh, there anymore, the internalization of racism in Indo-European communities continued. And my comrade Sarah Kledex wrote the following about this in her article named The Decolonization of the Indo. The Indo-European culture is a result of mixed marriages and it's formed by Indonesian and European influences. The culture arose within the power of structure of Dutch colonialism. This means that our thinking and the knowledge that we see as true is taught, up, is taught to us from, from this colonial perspective. Inherent to this colonial perspective is racism. In the Dutch East Indies, people were very clear in making distinctions in skin color and race, and we learned, most, mostly unconsciously, to see everything that is white or European as higher, more beautiful, and better. We are not only projecting this white ideal on the world around us, we also pro project it on our own culture and our own self-image." So, when we have all of this in the back of our minds, we can get a better understanding of the relationship between Indo-Europeans and racism. Of course, this was a very limited summary of uh, a way more uh, complex history, but looking at this history brings me to the conclusion that it's time for a revolution among Indo-Europeans. Instead of holding on to the colonial way of thinking that was forced upon, our, uh, was forced upon or internalized by our ancestors, I argue that we should decolonize our way of thinking. For me personally, this decolonization process is about researching and reviving my indigenous roots, but also it's about changing my way of thinking and doing. In the words of the amazing Bell Hooks, when radical activists have not made a core break with dominator thinking, imperialist, white supremacist, capitalist patriarchy, there is no union of theory and practice, and real change is not sustained. That's why cultivating the mind of love is so crucial. When love is the ground of our being, a love ethic shapes our participation in politics. Instead of aligning ourselves with white supremacists, I argue that we should fight racism in broad coalitions, build upon the principles of solidarity, intersectionality, and anti-capitalism. We should acknowledge that we can only win the struggle against racism if we have the masses on our side, we should acknowledge that different forms of oppressions are connected and interacting with each other. And finally, uh, we should acknowledge that we uh, need to fight capitalism if we want to overcome racism. In the words of Malcolm X, you can't have capitalism without racism. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Well, also a big thanks to Sudi Versama for inviting me here. 
Um, well, I will introduce myself shortly. I am uh, Lana Nuberg. I'm a historian. Uh, I graduated from the University of Amsterdam in 2014 with a master thesis on uh, violence um, and uh, the Dutch military invasion of North Sumatra in the period 1945-1950. Uh, and since 2017, I write the blog Gewonen in this Meisje. Um, this is a blog where I am uh, writing about the influence of colonial history on, uh, on the Netherlands. I keep saying Holland, but then Marjolein will look at me angry and say, no, it's the Netherlands. Um, and especially on Indo-Dutch families in the Netherlands. And uh, last year, I also researched during my travels to Indonesia uh, yeah, the legacy of colonialism uh, in Indonesia, but I'm not an expert on that, so I keep that to uh, someone else. As Marlene already uh, stated, I'm following the big research project that NIELT, NEMH, and KITV is um, doing right now closely. Um, for people that haven't heard of it yet, this is a research project that started in uh, 2016 and they are researching the violence of the Dutch military system in, an, uh, in Indonesia in the period between 1945 and 1950. And well, I think people from Indonesia uh, that are here, they all know that in Indonesia this period is known as Agressi Militaire Blanda. But here in the Netherlands, we still don't really have a good word for that period. Uh, well, we used to call it police actions for a very long time. So, when I first heard of this new research project, uh, I was delighted and curious because I thought, yes, finally, it's time to uh, yeah, research cri in a critical way what the Netherlands have done in this period. Also, during my master thesis, it was already uh, really uh, totally clear to me that Holland, the Netherlands, um, fought a colonial battle uh, in which they um, framed Indonesian uh, freedom defenders as extremists and rebels. Um, and in my master thesis, I also showed how Dutch soldiers themselves started to lose faith uh, in the battle they were fighting. So some of them, after uh, a couple of years being in Indonesia, they started to questioning themselves if they were truly liberators, as the Dutch uh, had told them, or that they were actually, yeah, sort of Nazis, because they were occupying a country that wanted to be free. But other soldiers, and I think uh, this is the biggest group of soldiers, they remained convinced by the fact that Indonesia belonged to the Netherlands. So they felt betrayed uh, after uh, 1949, when the Dutch uh, signed the sovereignty um, transmission in uh, Amsterdam. So after these soldiers came home, um, they kept their experience silent and they didn't talk about it. Uh, and for a long time, no one heard of it. Well, I will give a short uh, summary of how it went from there because I'm not sure if everyone uh, knows this history. But it took almost 20 years before the first person opened up about what happened in Indonesia in this period, 1945-1950. And this was Joop Huting. He was a veteran and in 1969, he opened up during a television program called After the News, After the News, Behind the News. Um, and there he explained the war crimes he committed and was uh, witnessed during his uh, military service in Indonesia. And he gave details in this uh, TV program about the killing of complete kampoons and their inhabitants committed without uh, any military necessity. And according to him, the things he witnessed and participated in were no exception, but daily business. This co confession of uh, Joop Hutting was the starting point of a discussion about Dutch violence in Indonesia in the period 1945-1950. And even now, 50 years after Hutting opened up, we are still not really sure how to place this past in the glorifying history of the Dutch nation. I mean, we are sea heroes, right? We came to explore, to trade, but definitely not to kill and oppress. To me, it's white innocence in its purest form. <coughs> so, what happened after uh, Joop Hutting appeared on Dutch television? <coughs> well, politically, it led to the Excessenota. 
only five months after uh, Hütting opened up. And this access nota can be translated as a list of excesses in which the Dutch government uh, researched the extreme violence that was committed or wasn't committed uh, in this period while Indonesia was fighting for to remain their freedom. And this list of excesses stated that there were no not so many war crimes committed in Indonesia and that there was not, not such a thing as extreme violence. So the public opinion uh, and the veterans, of course, could go back to a peaceful sleep in which it didn't have to give any recognition <coughs> or excuses towards the Republic of Indonesia. <coughs> and for many years, this remained the status quo, even though uh, rumors about Dutch war crimes never ended completely. This changed recently uh, after uh, Jeffrey Pondag uh, founded the uh, organization Yaya San Kaukabe with the aim to increase knowledge about Dutch war crimes committed in Indonesia. And in 2008, he filed the first lawsuits against the Dutch state, asking for recognition and financial reparations for the relatives of the men who got executed during the massacre of Rabakade on December 9, 1947. And in this uh, village on Eastern Java, the Dutch brutally killed 400 people without any trial or military reason. None of the Dutch soldiers were, uh, who were part of this crime were ever prosecuted, <coughs> although uh, this crime was known by the VN. In uh, 2011, Jeffrey won his first case against the uh, Dutch states toge uh, together with Lisbeth Segfeld, and after a long trial, uh, nine Indonesian relatives received 20,000 euro and official excuses uh, by the Dutch government. So after this acclaimed success, Bondag and Segfeld started a second trial, and this time collecting cases from the widows of South Sulawesi. And also uh, in this trial, uh, seven of these widows got compensations for the loss of her husbands, of their husbands, <coughs> during summary uh, execution executions ordered by Dutch Captain Westerling. Um, well, these cases they triggered uh, historians like Remy Limbach uh, and. Um, Gert Oost India, who uh, yeah, work for the <coughs> Dutch military, NEMA, the National Institute for Dutch Military History, and um, Gert Oost India from KITOV. Uh, and they asked in 2012, via an open letter in a newspaper, to, uh, to they asked the Dutch government to finance bigger and newer research to investigate this period uh, yeah, better. But this uh, open letter um, got declined, and it didn't get any money, money to start a new big research project. But then they both uh, wrote books. Kurt Oost India wrote the book uh, Soldaten in Indonesia, Soldier in Indonesia, and uh, Remy Limbach wrote the book The Burning Kampongs of General Spoor. And after uh, these books came out, um, suddenly the Dutch government awoke, uh, woke up, and they were like, "Oh, okay, maybe." Maybe bigger research is more necessary because, especially Remy Limbach, he stated that the Dutch use of violence uh, was not an exception, but um, yeah, was just common business and on, uh, happening on a large scale. So, in 2016, finally a new research proposal uh, got approved, and the main uh, goal of this research propos proposal was to uh, find answers on these three questions. On what scale did violence took place? What kind of uh, violence took place? And why did violence took place? Well, and if you just read that proposal quickly, it might sound like the Dutch is really <coughs> are really trying to deal with their colonial past. So, as I told you when I first heard of it, I was quite enthusiastic. Unfortunately, this enthusiasm didn't last very long, because when you take a closer look at the research design, things become quite problematic. Well, I have a couple of more <coughs> minutes to show you why, and I will do that based on the open letter that Jeffrey Pondag uh, wrote together with Indonesian intellectual Francesca Pantipelloi, and I do already uh, met her earlier today, and Historie Persana founder Marjolein van Pache. And they published this letter a couple of weeks after the first public kickoff of the big research project, Yet it took uh, them one and a half years before they were invited 
um, at the research team to explain their objections. Oh, and by the way, 150 international researchers, journalists, and publicists signed the open letter. Well, since I have no time to examine the whole letter, I will just summarize um, some of their points and focus on these two questions, uh, namely, is this research inclusive? So what was the formation of the research design? Who were involved and who weren't? Uh, what is the nature of the cooperation with Indonesian universities and researchers? And yeah, what does working closely together mean? And the second question is, is this research decolonial? So uh, where is the focus on racism and the colonial apartheid system in this research? And how, is, uh, is, uh, how colonial is this research and how it reflects the mismatch between historical facts and Dutch juridical statements? Okay, well, I have a question for you. Um, imagine. Uh, you get the assignment to investigate Dutch war crimes on a large scale. How would you set up your research? Who would you invite to draw the research outline together? Anyone? Jason? Anybody not linked to uh, Dutch defense, like uh, military organizations? Yeah. <laughs> J uh, JC says anyone who's not linked to Dutch military organizations. Okay, that's a good answer. So who would you invite then? If you don't invite these people. Okay, well, I would say maybe Indonesian historians or Indonesian organizations, or at least a neutral research institute from another country, maybe. But this is not what the Dutch do. Because when the Dutch create the outline of a big research project focusing on war crimes they themselves committed, they invite as their sparing partners the Dutch Veteran Institute, the Dutch Memorial Committee, and several Dutch organizations that focus on the victimhood of Dutch people during the Japanese occupation and the Garcia. So let me be clear, clear about this. These organizations exist all with the aim to honor Dutch veterans and commemorate Dutch war victims. They have a tradition of framing the Japanese as the great oppressor in Southeast Asia and uh, with framing Indonesians as ruthless extremists. I never caught any of these organizations on any critical note towards the Dutch rule as an extremely violent co colonizer. So. How could these organizations ever challenge the existing Dutch master narrative? How could, they involve, uh, how could their involvement possibly lead to critical research questions? Well, of course it didn't. And let's not forget that one of the three research institutes that uh, execute this whole project is the Dutch Institute for Military History. And this is the exact same organization that has to prove commissioned by the Dutch state, the reliability of Indonesian witnesses and their stories in the lawsuits filed again, filed by Jeffrey Bundag and uh, Lisbeth Segveld. So, and since the, this institute only uses Dutch sources, like military reports, um, there are results often opposed stories as being told by Indonesian witnesses. <coughs> so according to this institute, it means that as long as the story is not written down in Dutch military reports, there is no proof for it. So this research uh, institute that has, that has to ex execute this critical research project has actually a direct conflict of interest in asking critical questions. So, okay, where is the Indonesian perspective here? Because when this research project was announced, it was framed as a critical project unique in history and of history writing because for the first time ever Dutch historians would work closely together with Indonesian historians so maybe they invited Indonesian historians afterwards well they invited one namely uh, Professor Purvanto from the Gajamada University in Yogyakarta and um, they came to him with a final research outline and uh, they asked his opinion. <coughs> well, and he was not very delighted. So in the end, he decided to start his own research project, separate from the one of the Dutch. 
So what does this working closely together then mean? So when I asked questions about it, the head of research, Frank van Frey, explained that within the budget of 4.1 million uh, euros, there was room for four Indonesian researchers based on local Indonesian salaries. And since this team of uh, Dr. Puwanto is now researching their own separate project, it means that there is no one who is actually critically following the Dutch partners in this. And um, yeah, this, this um, Indonesian uh, project team also came up with another question uh, what the Dutch didn't uh, think of because uh, they are researching now the influence of the violence in 1945 and 1950 on social structures and trauma without the Indonesian, within the Indonesian population. So I think we can conclude that there is not such a thing as working closely together within this research. So that brings me to my second uh, question. Is this research colonial, uh, colonial or decolonial? Well, we will find um, the answers when we uh, look into the seven sub-studies in which none of uh, them is explicit, explicitly foca focusing on the question, what is a colony exactly? What does a colony mean for people who, who never asked for it? And what are the structures within a colony that legitimize the use of violence against indigenous people? To me, these questions would be the most important questions to ask if you want to find an answer on the why, why did the, did the Dutch use violence on such a large scale? What was the influence of racism, for example, uh, or of the history of 350 years dehumanizing brown and black bodies? The period 1945-1950 is by no means a single isolated period in history. It is the outcome of 350 years of colonial violence and oppression. And let's not forget that historians like Remco Rabe and uh, Piet Hage estimate that colonial violence <coughs> cost one million people their lives during uh, th these 350 years of Dutch presence in Indonesia. Yet, this is nowhere to be found in the research project. This brings me to the last point that I want to highlight today. Um, this research is colonial in how it reflects, in its very language, the mismatch between historical facts and Dutch juridical statements. Because when you talk about the period 1945-1950, it brings up a lot more complications than you might think of in the first place, and when you just take the colonial language we are taught in schools for granted. Because do, uh, did you know that until today, the Netherlands do not recognize the 17th of August 1945 as Indonesia's uh, Independence Day. Instead of that, the Dutch uh, use uh, juridical the 27th of December 1949 as the, as the real day of Indonesian in independence because on that day the, the papers were signed for uh, power transmission. On that, in that square on Amsterdam. And actually when you look at this frame, so you have on one hand the frame of the co ex-colonizer and on the other uh, hand the uh, yeah, 17 August 1945, which is recognized by the rest of the world, it brings in some difficulties while talking about historic uh, research towards this period. <clears throat> because let's look at some facts. Um, because if you use the Dutch juridical statement, so you say Indonesia became independent on the 27th of uh, December 1949, you should, uh, this will be your research frame. So even though the uh, Japanese conquered the Dutch in 1942, the Indonesian archipelago still belongs to the Netherlands. Okay. After the proclamation of Sukarno and Hatta, the Dutch sent troops to fight against her own nationals because in the end, all people that were living in this part of the world belonged uh, to the Dutch flag. So all victims, even the people that fought for, the Indonesian, uh, for Indonesian freedom, they were inhabitants of the Dutch kingdom, living under the Dutch flag and rule. And it also means that the Dutch military killed her own inhabitants that were defending an independent and free state. Or actually, when we take this, I, I made a mistake, because if we take this frame, 
we, we are, they are not defending an independent state, but they are fighting for an independent and free state. Um, so what, what kind of frame do we get when we use the viewpoint that the whole, whole world is actually using? The 17th of August, 1945, is Indonesia's Independence Day. So that means that two days after Japanese capitulation, Indonesia became a sovereign country. It means that the Dutch started a war against a sovereign state. It means that the Dutch tried to recolonize a sovereign state. It means that all acts of violence against Indonesian citizens are war crimes. It means that all acts of Indonesian violence against Dutch loyalists are acts of resistance. Conclusion, the Dutch behaved as Nazis. Well, let's take a second of silence for that. Um, so yeah, these two perspectives, they bring a completely different framework in how you research this history. And also they show us double standards of how the Dutch experienced their history. Just some questions that pop up. Pop up. Taking the Dutch juridical statement as a starting point, it leads to a couple of contradictions. For example, why does the Netherlands not commemorate the inhabitants of the Dutch kingdom that got killed by the Dutch military while fighting for their freedom? Why are Dutch historians talking about brutal Indonesians while in this period the Netherlands doesn't even recognize Indonesia as a sovereign country? So why do we use the word Indonesians then? And the same, um, yeah, the same happens for the word for the word Indonesian war, which I also saw <coughs> written down on the website of the research project. How can we use the word Indonesian war if we don't even recognize this country as existing in this period? So taking Indonesia's uh, independence on the 17th of August as a starting point, we should ask ourselves other questions. For example, why do we in the Netherlands talk about Japanese occupation, um, but never about Dutch occupation or Dutch recolonization? Why do Dutch publicists and historians keep calling Indonesian resistance fighters, republicans, extremists, rebels, or nationalists? And uh, why did the Netherlands never pay reparations to India, over to India, to Indonesia, uh, but made Indonesia pay to stay independent, as Michael stated earlier today? Because I think in all other cases, when a country starts an unfair war to another country, in the end, the person that loses pay the bill, right? But in this case, Indonesia had to pay Holland. Um, so yeah, even though and this is actually quite funny as well, because the researchers of Neo, Kai Teofe, and Enyem Ha, they say to acknowledge the historical fact that Indonesia became independent on the 17th of August, 1945. But they do not explain their own contradictions in thinking. And also, it's not visible in their research outline. None of this is visible in their research outline. So did they even ask themselves the questions I just mentioned while creating this proposal? I'm talking way too long, right? Sorry. Uh, the word resistance fighters is, for example, uh, never used in their research proposal. The word Dutch occupation is nowhere to be found. Uh, Dutch propaganda against people like Sukarno is not pointed out as a focus of uh, research. And the fact that Indonesia paid 4.5 billion guilders for their independence um, to be acknowledged by their former colonizer is also nowhere stated. And while neglecting all of those things, how will we ever be able to understand why we, the Netherlands, as a country, fought such dirty war against the people of a country that won it? Or when we take 17th of August 1945 as Indonesia as Independence Day, continue to be free? How will we ever be able to understand our role in uh, our our own role in world history. Well, I will conclude with some words to hopefully make you understand why I think it's important to investigate this history from a truly uh, critical, inclusive, and decolonial starting point. And I think um, my reason for that, why it connects with uh, JC's story, because to me, it's not only of great significance for a country to be able to look in a mirror, acknowledge your own mistakes, and see where your privilege comes from, but it's also important for a lot of people personally, uh, for example, for me. 
I also grew up in a, in a European family with grandparents that never understood why they had to leave the Dutch Indies and why Indonesian people suddenly turned their back against Dutch power. And my grandma, uh, she died in 2005 without ever seeing her country again. And she lost the ground on which she was born and grew up on. And she never wants to visit it again. She was never able to challenge her views on Indonesian independence, stuck within the Dutch colonial propaganda and Tempaduri stories as she was told as a kid. In the Netherlands, still, it's not general business to frame Sukarno as a freedom fighter. Until today, influenced by colonial propaganda, it found its way into the history books, he is often framed as a radical nationalist in a negative way. The lack of understanding history through the perspective of the oppressed caused a lot of unnecessary hate and grief in my own family. But I don't want to look down on Indonesia like my grandma did, and I don't want to look down on the people whose blood is literally running through my veins. What I want is to understand history and to find peace with it. And that understanding I can only find if I know the, true, the truth and the true colors of colonialism. Because to me, immorality lies peace, and not in reproducing colonial propaganda. Unfortunately, as I stated, I'm afraid that this new research project, in the way it is designed right now, will not bring the true and moral facts about our past. Thank you. And so uh, to close up dr dramatic, is this research inclusive? Is it inclusive? No. <laughs> <laughs>
professor in archaeology and art history of South of South East Asia at Leiden University. The collection primarily uh, contains material from Indonesia and include copies of Japanese and Balinese manuscript, prints, photograph, drawing, graphic material, and as you can see, there is also like a invitation from uh, the exhibition opening. So Theodor Paul Galstein. So this is I translated from with Google Translate because it's like the, from the digital uh, collection in the University of Leiden. Uh, Theodor Paul Galstein was born on June 1907 in Jakarta. He spent his youth between Jakarta, California, and Den Haag. Uh, uh, in 1927, he started his study in Indo-Iranian arts at the University of Leiden. <coughs> so he also okay. Galstein had also been one of the founder of monthly magazine of Cultural Indie, published under the responsibilities of Colonial Institute. On December 1945, he was honored to resign as a curator at the Colonial Institute for his appointment as extraordinary professor in the art history of East Asia. He was also reported travel continuously to Java, Bali, and India. Uh, this is The Art of Indonesia, a book by Fritz Awardner. This book was published by Holler Favelat, Baden-Baden, Germany in 1959. The record of the preface, preface was signed at Harlem at Christmas 1958. Fritz Wagner of the Royal Institute for the Tropic Amsterdam traces a historical development of the art of Indonesia from the Neolithic age to, Indon to Indonesia 19th and 20th century. <coughs> Until this presentation is made, I was not able to find out who was Fritz Wagner. The book was simple but complete. Also, it presented the, chron the chronological table and glossary. Easy to digest with colorful and striking illustration. It crossed to my mind. Uh, it crossed to my mind whether this book is a dummy book for readers who want to know informative story in a brief, dense, clear way. I asked why the figure and the book as not, are not as famous as Claire Holt, which Holt included this book in her bio bibliography. In her introduction, I only found the author supplied the, with image and archive from the publisher. Then some archive were obtained from the Royal Institute in Amsterdam. A very complete and descript descriptive difference compared to the introductory explanation in Claire Holt's book. There, Holt explained and addressed where she got the image and archive, from whom and which way she can finally finish the book. This comparison may be very, super, very superficial, but for me, this is enough to explain how far the writer or researcher reviews <coughs> and examine the research subject. Okay, so is this uh, I got this selection when I visited the Ambassador Camp, who is actually here, in September 2016. At the time, I was keen on research for an exhibition that carried the colonial ideas in Brussels, Bazaar. From the conversation that is housed in his office in front of computer, Pim invites me to virtually penetrate space and time. This is uh, from Roden Saleh. And this is a little after an original painting by Roden Saleh, Forest Fire. The original painting was owned by the Dutch royal family. I read in 2016. It came to the news of uh, the work now is in the National Gallery Singapore, donated by Yong Hon, Yong Hon Kong Foundation. So this uh, acquisition it's also sparked a debate in Netherlands, but I cannot access the. Uh, the news because I think it's in the in Dutch. This is still from the collection of the museum, Otto Jaya 
And as you mentioned also Agus Jaya, had lived through various Indonesian regime from Dutch colonial, the, the Japanese invasion, revolution, and the rule of Soekarno, and even through the Suharto era. Last year, in 2018, the Link Museum revisiting the archive and art of the two brothers in an exhibition called the Jaya Brother Revolusi in the Sterling. I don't know if you uh, come, went to often to uh, Stedelijk or to the museum. The other one is uh, Avandi, a maestro in Indonesia painting. This is uh, some poster. And I also found this uh, 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 artwork. The ideas of uh, Tempo Dulu can be intriguing. Uh, yet misguided, since it has an idea of Moi Indi, the term that uh, only works for the Dutch to illustrate that they stay in Indonesia is heavenly, in contrast to Indonesian laws during occupation. Later, this idea in art making is repeated. In so many cases, the tempo rule transforms into a contemporary approach of retracing Dutch white heritage, finding the source of somebody's identity, POC networking, contrasting the old and new Indonesian from the colonial period to now, research on colonial research on colonial monument, the treatment of memory and collective set heritage. To be completely honest, this approach so often departs from the privilege of being Dutch white artists as if by doing this project they can wave their, their colonial scenes. Artistically, for me it's uh, offered nothing also. This is the work by Econo Groho, and this is the work by Harry Dono, and this is the work by John Pat, uh, who this display is uh, from the, the exhibition called Grand Parade, Theatrical Art Installation, curated by Anke Bangma in Chopin Museum. So, both of uh, three of these artists' uh, career peaked during the Reformasi era when Indonesia was breaking free from the reign of the New Order regime. It was an intense and exciting period in Indonesia contemporary art history. Freedom of expression had suddenly become a reality. We can find contemporary interpretation of traditional art symbol and social political issues in their painting or in their installation. They appropriate, reinvented, and subverted the popular culture, new media, and a dash of traditional saturated Japanese style to address the experience of daily encounter in a newly reformed society. Merging high art with popular culture, they emerge as one of the most popular and accessible interpreters of contemporary Indonesian experience in the post reformist era. Hybridity, hybridity form of folk art, sense of humor, satire, and comical scenes as scope since a scoping mechanism to process the political and social turbulence in Indonesia as social commentary. Um, this is still in from the, uh, the list from the Museum. This is from Marianto. Uh, this landscape is actually uh, illustrate the colonizer and capitalist <coughs> through technological development, industrialization, pollution of the land, exploitation of its natural research. This one is from uh, Roy Philippe. The title Madonna after Omoma and Celine is a life-size sculpture in synthetic resin of a real person, Rodan Omoma, a Papua band holding a naked composite baby. Uh, this one is a uh, babies of the artist. In general, uh, this is also from Roy, who is now uh, in the Tropen Museum collection. So if you go to Tropen Museum now, you can see these uh, two artworks of Roy. And also next to Roy artwork, the uh, the piece of uh, clothes. Next to the artwork, it's uh, this uh, artifact from New Guinea, which is makes me had a, like a mixed feeling because it can maybe like because like Roy is uh, the point departure of Roy Arthur gets uh, critic, critics to the 
to the ideas of Indonesia of, uh, colonizer to Papua, but with this display, um, I still. Okay, this is also in the museum. This photo is not taken from my uh, phone, but this is from the uh, website. <coughs> Here in this display, I ask how a visual narration framed by institution become paralyzed, rigid, and have a strong on, of unpleasant smell. My commentary of for this display, it was time, maybe it was time to say goodbye to the ideas that that that, that this kind of presentation of mannequin objects and artifacts from Indonesia are ethnographic. The politic of display assemble the undeveloped society that need enlightenment. The ideas of Indonesia today has been lacking in the Netherlands for too long. Until then, the audience is dependent on the viewing days of ethnographical gaze. Okay, so this presentation, uh, this is like the contemporary art exhibition. This slide, this slide, dry visit exhibition featuring modern art and contemporary art from Indonesia and abroad perspective by including Dutch, Indonesian, or identity in between for a closer look at colonial history, <coughs> intertwined and intersect as subject of curatorial and our historical debates. This way, it's like uh, beyond the Dutch. In 2009-2010, focus on three periods, cultural influencing during the colonial period, the consequence of decolonization and independence and the present period of post-colonialism. Each period focus collective influence and search heritage with, within the visual art. This one, the other exhibition, it's uh, the point of departure of suspended history curated by Thomas Berghaus, 2013, was relationship between the Van Loon family. Their generation held high position at the Dutch East Indies com Company <coughs> of Yosu and the Dutch East India Company in the 17th and 18th century. The artists investigate the museum collection and its historical context to their own background connected to homeland, cultural identity, migration, assimilation, and displacement. Uh, I will move to the contemporary artists who I work uh, closely. So this is a photograph, <coughs> this is the work by Octora. The photography becomes the effective, for her, the photography becomes the effective tools which contribute in constructing the otherness. In a way, the indigenous portraits which were taken are not just more an object. It has passive, aggressive character on it. There are hidden power on it and force evident which invalid to represent the actual reality. <coughs> The beautiful photograph of the young Balinese girl are, sedu are seducing and flattering, but on the same time, feel guilty. It was a kind of voyeurism act that was the starting point of her investigation with this project. So, this is my. <laughs> this is a, a project uh, from Wimah Balabaya. Uh, the title was Belanda Sudah Dekat, or The Dutch is Approaching. It's a photography project from a twisted common joke in which when you are in hurry or panic in Indonesia, they will say, calm down, the Dutch are still far away. <laughs> <laughs> we will ask, we, uh, I, uh, we, ask part, we will ask participation to post carrying water gun to several community. The aim of the project was an alert and rethinks our post-colonial condition and how uh, we can decolonize ourselves in a very uh, humorous way. Uh, and comic away. This is uh, the quote that I uh, get from the uh, Wemo uh, Instagram. The artist is here, Angga. It's in the audience. Angga Wadpusno, uh, this is the exhibition, uh, this is the project that uh, we make together in the exhibition in Bozar in Brussels. Representation of colonial action such as weapons, money, nutmeg, this is what basically represent colonialism, violence, economic rotation, and resource exploitation are often misinterpreted as trade relation. Whereas the three factors that funded 
the colonial journey eventually end up begin museum, research center, and the existence of the object that become collection in metropolitan area. The museum is also highlighted as product colonialism that carries out its cultures and policy, not only its products, but how colonialism distracts the public from the accessibility of the knowledge content in each which tangible in objects, artifacts, archive in its collection. Of course, violence is not used directly here in the artwork. But if you look far back, they are funded from the wheels of the economy and exploitation of power in the colonies who use violence in farming and slavery. Oops. This is uh, the <coughs> artwork from uh, from Irwan Ahmed and Tita Salina in Jogja Biennale. I forgot which year. Um, they work. So they work with dancing, reciting classical poem, reading the agreement on restitution of 1755, Hacking Gianti. The title was Hacking Gianti. A question to historical legitimacy on Gianti agreement, which was signed and has been a source of agrarian conflict in Yogyakarta. Yava, feudalism, and Dutch colonialism are core of this astonishing and gospel performance. This is all so uh, the artwork from Roy Villeva. Uh, I uh, I work with him for uh, the same exhibition with Anga. It's in Bazaar in Brussels. <coughs> mm, perhaps this is the work most obvious revealing this complexity is Roy Villeva. It's called Amun Bear and Edmund. In the context of Papua Indonesia. The subversive element of nudity is used by the Papuan to reclaim their identity. It is an act against oppressive koteka or oppression penis gourd, which encourage indigenous people to wear modern clothing. The work examines the question of Papuan identity that are raised by Indonesian rules. Gilegua has been working in the region for over 20 years. This cultural reenactment portrays his friend Amun Be who contribute to the conceptualization of the work. And for the reason mentioned above, was particularly proud to be depicted in, nude, in the nude. The work does not simply represent a seemingly stereotypical image of colonialism that obstructs the imagination and the potential <coughs> for real understanding. Rather, through exchanging and combining different inter interacting perspectives, Indonesian, Dutch, and Asmat, each with their own explanation and understanding of history. The multi-layer nature of the work is revealed, as well as the multiple possible stories encompassed in Amun Berian Nightmare. So this artist in my last slide, sigh away from the essentialist ideas of the Dutch is banned and Indonesia is the victim. The tradition of modernist Western learning Leaning built from the top to bottom, top down, diluted with the practice of artists who create narrative stories and artistic projects that looking on missing perspective and, and muted at the grassroots that eventually fills the narrative that is not heard. The exchange of ideas and practice of modern art are overlaid and confronted with colonialism, modernity, and nationalism. Critical dialogues are still needed to re-examine these histories and connect them together and artistic work are often useful key to uncovering links and across time and space that are not there that are not immediately apparent. Uh, but I hope you realize that uh, this presentation is like of a uh, woman artist. So maybe I will just uh, conclude that. Thank you. Is that your conclusion? Yes. <laughs> Yay. 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 Oh, yeah. Maybe a question for uh, for Jesse. So you, you mentioned that in the uh, town council you got different parties to agree on 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 certain things about the textbooks. I think. So do you think that there is a possibility of of 
getting some kind of solidarity across the different uh, parties in, in the established political scene. For what? For, for this, this kind of activism. So you said that you had managed to find people, uh, organizations, parties in the council that agree, agreed to make changes, for example, in terms of textbooks. So do you think other things like that are possible, or was this an exception? So uh, yes, and actually the, the city council in Amsterdam uh, isn't doing that bad when it comes to uh, looking critically at the, at the role of uh, the Netherlands and also the city itself in, in, in uh, colonial history. Um, then again, like Amsterdam is the, the, the by far uh, the most progressive city in uh, the Netherlands, I would say. Um, so, so yeah, we are trying to do uh, as much as we can, and I think uh, actually most parties here uh, also uh, agree with 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 um, the line that 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 well, colonialism wasn't <laughs> wasn't that good. <laughs> Um, but uh, the the national government uh, is uh, yeah well is, has another uh, uh, opinion on that and so I don't think we can expect like the national government that has the most influence on like how for example the educational system is organized I don't think that we can expect anytime soon that they will make any like decolonial uh, changes but Amsterdam is doing uh, the best it can it. It, it can, and like there's a, even a, uh, a museum on slavery. Uh, um, well, at least they're researching now if there can be a museum on slavery, and uh, there are like a variety of initiatives uh, taken by the city council in Amsterdam focused on uh, on uh, uh, critically uh, looking at the colonial history. Yeah. More questions? Two already. Thank you, Roth. The question goes for uh, Lara and for JC. JC used the term indigenous blood, and Lara used the, uh, the phrase that the blood which runs through your veins. I would like you both to explain what you mean by the word blood. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, well, that's of course a good question. I think for me, it's about, yeah, well, I understand what you mean, because it, when we start talking about blood, it can also become quite dangerous and scary. Um, but for me, I have to acknowledge that the, the way I look, this, the color of my skin, the color of my hair, it comes from certain people. That it doesn't come from your blood, it's exactly my point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that might be, okay. Yeah, Jay-Z, help me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I'm not sure like how you use the term, but I, I like I refer to it as, and I, I, I guess you do the same. That like um, I said, because uh, uh, the Indo-Europeans had, and it's more like paraphrasing, like colonial, uh, colonial. Um, language had like indigenous blood because it was it was it, it, back in those times they literally uh, uh, said that um, like these Indo-European children were um, that their pure white blood was being uh, um, how do you call it like uh, vergiftigd with 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 indigenous blood so it's not like that I believe that the blood has uh, has anything to do with it but it was like paraphrasing and referring to the way how they used uh, this language in colonial times. Yeah. Okay. Which, of course, you, is, which of course is very racist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this makes sense, your answer, because now it makes clear what you, uh, yeah. how you were using it, because I think it's a very dangerous thing to talk about blood. Thank you. So did Michael wanted to comment yeah. to that as well? Um, yeah, I'm kind of, I'm kind of uh, worried about uh, the, the comments that you gave there. Um, um, let me make clear that um, when you talk about indigenous identities and all, um, indigenous people don't have the same social construct as a colonizer has. So you cannot um, uh, connect indigenous, uh, being indigenous, to a social construct like uh, 
or blood or race or whatever or gender. Um, I think um, um, I have some information for you if you want about how indigenous um, identity um, is formed and uh, how indigenous communities see identity um, uh, outside these uh, social constructs that you use to, uh, to uh, describe your, your social construct. Because so, I think this is wrong. Actually. Sorry. Any comment or to oh. <coughs> I mean, uh, I'm intrigued by, by, by <coughs> what you said about the museum, because uh, the the, uh, Slavrne, uh, the slavery museum that Amsterdam is planning to build, because it is being debated now very fiercely, because it is only about the transatlantic slavery, and not the slavery that comes from the Indies, which was bigger, much, much bigger, and that's not going to come... What? The, the slavery in, in, from the Indies is much, much bigger than the slavery, uh, than the transatlantic <coughs> slavery. And that's going, the only one part of the, tra uh, the, of the uh, uh, slavery that, that are going to, to be represented in the museum and not the whole story of slavery. So that's, uh, uh, I'm not sure whether the Amsterdam City Council, especially the Green, who is now in power, really understand I'm afraid it's going to just to appease the people from Suriname that is for only for them, but not really not the whole story of slavery. Yeah, so thank you. So so yeah, I don't I don't actually think that the that the slave trade in general in the in the Indies was bigger than the transatlantic uh, uh, trade. Uh, wow. But the Dutch, the, the, the Dutch share in uh, slave trade in the uh, region of the Indian Ocean was bigger than the Dutch share in the transatlantic slavery. But I'm not sure if if the if the whole of uh, slave trade there was bigger than the transatlantic uh, slave trade. But um, yeah, no, you're right that um, the the proposal, as it was accepted by the city council, um, says uh, that the museum should be about transatlantic slavery. And that's very interesting because actually the arguments that are given in the proposal um, are uh, also about the Dutch East uh, India Company and about how the city of Amsterdam was built with money uh, uh, well uh, stolen from colonies. And actually most of that money was stolen from, uh, from, from the Dutch East India uh, Colony. So uh, yeah, that's very, uh, very interesting. And actually the, the, the network that I uh, co-founded, we are campaigning against this. And uh, we know, and I've spoken to the uh, elderman about this, and I've, I've also um, uh, discussed this in the commission, and there is a majority among um, basically all political parties in the city council to broaden it and to make it inclusive. Um, the only thing is that they don't want to uh, do this uh, right now because the process is already uh, started, and yeah, so. But yeah, the discussion is still going, but um, there is a majority to broaden it. But yeah, it's like a c complex <laughs> story also, which uh, I don't think we have enough time to really delve into it, but we could talk about it later on. But I think you don't have to worry that it will just focus on transatlantic slavery, because uh, there already have been uh, um, some agreements from, from like political parties and also like the elder men about broadening, it, uh, broadening the museum. Maybe you can mention the event that you're organizing in person? Yeah, I've, I've, yeah, that's slaughtered. Uh, I don't think oh. I can say that here. Yeah. Oh. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I saw another uh, question. Okay, uh, so my question is for uh, Ritza. Uh, so my question is about um, the attempt of decolonization through the repatriation of uh, cultural objects, or we call it yeah, artifacts. And so far, there are some success stories. Um, we already got the uh, Negara Kartagama, and also the Prasna Paramita statue uh, that have been brought from Muslim Volkunde, if I'm not mistaken, yes. to Indonesia. And I think that that's also one of like quite effective um, way to, to, to talk about this uh, decolonization. And um, what do you think the next step is? Like, uh, what kind of object? that need to be repatriated soon um, yeah, to get this whole story. I think that's a tricky question because uh, if you ask me like 
what kind of object should repatriate. I think the question should ask to the to the people, to the community in Indonesia who feel that there is an object that needs to be repatriated. So I don't really that and also like the ideas of repatriation. Hmm. I actually maybe I can refer to the uh, uh, projects that uh, are collective uh, in Jogja Life Patch uh, work. Uh, they work in the uh, museum collection in mass in Antwerp. Uh, they work with the collection of uh, Sisinga Mangaraja and Hans Christoffel. But then. Uh, when the, they, they come to Antwerp, they come to Museum Brownback, and after this uh, research, they went back to the community in North Sumatra, and the uh, artists, I'm paraphrasing this research, uh, the artists uh, take some pictures, and they, they, question, they, they ask the question to this uh, community, whether this object it should be returned, but they say like, uh, that's not important, the museum can have the objects, but the history is still life in, again, it's in our blood. <laughs> they say like this is in our community. So I think there is uh, an idea of uh, between the Eurocentric view and <coughs> I'm not saying that this community in North Sumatra can uh, 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 represent all the community in Indonesia, but this is like one of so many cases then also like represent the ideas of there are so many voices that should be included <coughs> when you want to talk about repatriation. So when they ask about this object, uh, back to my uh, mm, thinking is there is like a Eurocentric view that uh, the museums always need uh, to get an object which is uh, for me, it's like kind of like modernist thinking. Why, why can we just like uh, invite museum that not uh, contain an objects, for example, that's my, that's my question. Can we start from this uh, oral history or can we uh, start from the collective memories of <coughs> people? So that's, just, that's a tricky question. I cannot <laughs> answer that, but that's only my. <laughs> yeah, if you said like what kind of object, like I don't know, like I, I really don't know. Okay, I think it will be like a long debate between us if we can do like this, so we can do an answer. I study archaeology and especially the vision studies, and I see how it can value uh, like the unity of the people of Indonesia itself and give the identity of like uh, a certain tribes, for example, like Orang Bata. Uh, they have like the Pustaka here, they have like the Sisina Maharaja here, and how to build the identity of the tribe. Yeah, yeah, it's really complex. Yeah, right? but also it's also uh, <laughs> but there's also we 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 need also to debate the, the infrastructures in Indonesia. Oh, yeah. yeah. But that's lo another long story. Yeah. So when we want to invest to infra the infrastructures in Indonesia, like a museum or collection, or like how we supposed to co uh, collect all the objects, like maybe we should ask not repatriate. The, ob the the object from the Dutch museum or to the, the uh, to the to the Dutch policy or I don't know like how to call them. Uh, maybe it's uh, is there possible if they invest to the infrastructures that actually from this uh, artwork it actually came from the slavery or land exploitation that happened in during colonial time. Like you know, like this is only my uh, reflection because like I I know nothing about in infras art infrastructures or infrastructures in Indonesia. We always dream that we have like a museum or uh, but the dream of having museum is also the dream of the modernist or the Eurocentric view. Like we need a museum. Like like why don't we in like this is or like redefining what museum that the people needs in Indonesia. I think. Yeah. That's a. Uh, okay. <laughs> uh, uh, my question is, 
how do you raise this kind of awareness to the people of Indonesia itself and the awareness of this like identity and the kesadaran kesadaran uh, untuk uh, the awareness for the people of Indonesia to get their uh, objects and like yeah what you already explained in your presentation or for example in a simple question uh, how do you reach like people common people that don't really like to go to museum and watch art to get the message from your art how to reach like broader society through your art for the meaning of decolonization and blah 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 Maybe I can help you. I have all kinds of options of uh, <laughs> possibilities, but I really don't know like how to answer because like it's uh, okay. Maybe you yeah, want to say something. And this will be can be the last comment because I think it's yeah. time to to the next. So. Yeah. I I had a, a breakfast this morning. Uh, but he, he's a musafir, so he had he he doesn't have to uh, to, uh, to to do to do the Ramadan. <laughs> But anyway, he's, he's the uh, Director General of Culture in Indonesia, uh, Hilmar Farid. I had met him this morning uh, on his way to, he, he went back to Jakarta already in the plane. But he was here uh, for a week to have th such discussions with Dutch museums, among others with the Rex Museum. Because Rex is planning, oh yeah, <laughs> with you too, yeah. Because Rex is planning to, s to research uh, Intan Banjarmasin, <coughs> the diamond of Banjarmasin. Because yeah. it, I mean, but how is it? Uh, because this is this comes from through colonialism. So how is this going to? Uh, because they plan to, to and then even to give it back to Indonesia. It's not only pra Prasna Paramita, but also other other objects. You're right to to mention that we have to know our own facilities, our own infrastructure. Do we have it? That's the first thing. And the other thing is to find out who's the actually the owner of the in, of the Indian Manjarmasin. Who is the owner? And of course, if you find the owner, then you should ask him, are you, is it okay for you if you put it in a museum? Museum is, I'm afraid, unavoidable. You have to build the infrastructure. And that's the, that's the discussion now. Because it, Rijks Museum is one of the, um, I should say, progressive museum in the world. And everybody is looking at Rijks now. Because they are planning to do research on these things. Whether uh, those objects come, uh, you know, uh, uh, through a, a legal way or through colonialism. That's it. Yeah. <coughs> I had one last comment. Last, last, last. Uh, I just will add that it's an answer to your question as well. That the Trove Museum has just uh, a few months ago published a framework for return of cultural objects on, and the criteria. And on this moment, we are. Uh, working together with the Indonesian embassy to have it translated into Indonesia so that it is much more accessible for other people. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm sorry that the topics of today are so, um, so interesting. So interesting. <laughs> so many. So I think maybe each topic deserves a separate seminar.